Yes, Leanne, can I ask you, first of all, um, your reaction to this uh, release of all of McCartney's lyrics? It demonstrates, doesn't it, just how prolific this guy is. It's not actually all the lyrics of all the songs. He's chosen 154 songs. Why? Um, randomly, I guess. In response to the many requests over the years to write his autobiography. He never kept a diary. So where is he going to start? You know, he's not going to read other people's books and glean the information from there. So he decided to tell his story through the lyrics to certain of his songs. And he's worked with an Irish poet, a guy called Paul Muldoon. They've taken five years over this. Um, Paul has been interviewing Paul and he's put together a transcript. And they've created not something chronological, but actually going through the chosen songs alphabetically. So it leaps around. And it's got a lot of stuff in it that actually is already out there. Uh, the story in particular about John Lennon having quit the Beatles first before Paul McCartney, that's actually in my book. So maybe he picked it up out of there. I think he might have done a bit of uh, plagiarism. But uh, Leslie Ann, I mean, the guy, he is a songwriting machine, isn't he? It's remarkable just how much work he has produced over the years. Totally. There's a, there's a great story that he was with Dustin Hoffman on one occasion. And Dustin said to him, Paul, can you write a song about anything at all? And Paul said, yeah, I'll show you. And he sat right in front of him and he wrote uh, the Picasso's Last Words song, the one that goes, drink to me, um, drink to whatever. I can't remember the lyrics. It's on Band on the Run, but it's a very famous track. Yeah. And Dustin said he saw with his own eyes, actually, this guy can just sit there and write a song. So it is almost machine-like. He wrote his very first song at the age of 14, I lost my little girl. That was actually about his mother who died when Paul was about 11. And that's what started it, really. There's always dysfunction. There's always tragedy. There's always something missing in a child who goes on to be a creative songwriter. I've examined these guys for so many years, and there are so many similar traits. There has to be something that kicks it off, and it's generally something tragic. Uh, absolutely. And of course, that united uh, the two songwriters. Uh, Leslie Ann, before I come to you, Mike, Leslie Ann, can I ask you about the lyrics themselves? I mean, we know what a remarkable gift for melody Paul McCartney has. Is he much of a lyricist or do you think that John Lennon had the edge when it came to soulful words? It's impossible to compare them because they were such different songwriters. John was acerbic and caustic and wrote advertising slogans, really, that he linked together to create songs. Paul's been a much more soulful writer, somebody who's dug very deep into his own emotions. He has written about his life experiences all the way through, whereas John, I think, resisted the reality of his own life, and he was a bit more abstract. He strayed into fantasy worlds and uh, wrote about people he'd made up rather than actually writing about himself. So I think we can't and we shouldn't compare them. Mike Parry, what do you think this book of lyrics will tell us about McCartney the artist, McCartney the man? Well, look, McCartney's the most famous man on earth almost, isn't he? You know, everybody on planet Earth's heard a Beatles song and Paul McCartney's either written half of it or, or all of it, so we'll know about that. Just to remind my great friend Leslie Ann, by the way, it was Drink to Me, Drink to My Health. Um, as she quite rightly <laughs> says, that track from right, uh, Bandle Um the, the thing <laughs> I get from it is that... You know, I'm a Beatles fanatic. Leslie Ann is a professional. She's a she's a, a renowned historian of the Beatles. I'm just a fanatic and wants to know everything I possibly can about all the Beatles, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, everybody else. The closest I've ever got to uh, a biography was this one, written by Leslie Ann's very good friend, Philip Norman. But there's so much more in the um, lyrics book. For instance, I, I kind of knew that the song She Came In Through the Bathroom Window was written about one of the Apple Scroffs who spent their time camping outside Paul McCartney's house. But until I got into the detail of, uh, of this book, the lyrics, I didn't realise that she climbed up a ladder, got in through the bathroom and stole a picture of a member of Paul's family, thought to be his father. 
bother and then left again. And then Paul McCartney had to go out to the front gates and negotiate to get his picture back. And, you know, gems like that are, are, are just absolutely wonderful. The, the, there's a real revelation in here about the film A Day in the Life, which is one of the most famous Beatles songs ever. Um, I think it was the last track on Sergeant Pepper's. And everybody always asks, why did Paul McCartney bother inserting the words in the middle? You know, it was John Lennon started it, John Lennon finished it, and Paul McCartney, you know, got up, got out of bed, I drive the comb across my head, is in the middle. But when this book comes out, people have had a look at it, and, and, and I've been looking at it, and Paul McCartney now claims ownership on the, um, you know, the main line in that song, which is he blew his brains out in a car. And for years... It had just been assumed that, um, that that was John Lennon's line, but Paul, you know, claims some uh, ownership to that. The, the great thing about it is it not only tells us a lot about Paul McCartney, it tells us an awful lot about John Lennon as well, because as you quite rightly say, they had this love-not-hate relationship, but a love-rivalry relationship all the way through their careers together. And Paul glosses a little bit over the tension times. For instance... Um, there are some songs that Paul wrote, which John Lennon hated. Oobla dee, oobla da. He couldn't, he couldn't stand it. And um, the other one was Maxwell's Silver Hammer, which even Ringo Starr has said was one of the most difficult songs he ever worked on because it was so complicated, you know, and Paul would insist on doing it again and again and again. And that may well have done uh, or may well have led to the start of the end of the Beatles because John was accusing Paul of his granny music, but... The granny music looks pretty good to me in the lyrics book when you examine the um, all, all the words. The other thing I got out of this, which was incredible, was I didn't realise we can work it out was actually a message to Jane Asher. When Paul McCartney and Jane Asher were going out together, Paul McCartney was living in the Asher family house near Harley Street because her father was a doctor. And, of course, he was off touring around the world and she was at home in London. And th this was the first sign that their relationship was going to crumble. We can work it out. If you look at the lines, you know, try to see it my way. Um, he was actually saying that to Jane Asher. And let it be. Let it be a plea to the other Beatles. Let's stop rowing. Let it be. He wanted the Beatles to go on. It's very obvious from that in his words of the song, let it be. Leslie, you know what? I'd love to say that, <laughs> that yeah, go a lot of these stories are actually in my book. So this is not new mm. stuff. I think Paul is just, he's revisiting his life and he's revisiting the stories. He's forgotten because he's of a great age now. He's forgotten that a lot of this is out there already. The song you referred to just now, A Day in the Life, traditionally yeah. John's song. We've always believed that John Lennon wrote this song. The guy they're referring to is a, a, a deceased gentleman called Tara Brown. He oh, was Brown, killed at yeah. the age of 21. He was the Guinness heir, and he blew his mind out in a car, not his brains. But um, <laughs> his mind, his brains, years, yeah. Paul said for years that he wrote this about a politician. And now he's saying, mm. no, 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 actually, it was about Tara Brown. But did John write that or did Paul write that? John isn't here to argue. And that's the thing yeah. that's sad for me is why wait until now? You know, Paul's had 40 more years of life than John Lennon had. Um, he's Indeed. not here to state his case. Well, do you so think why McCartney... would Paul try and reclaim these songs now? Well, well I agree with you, Les Leslie Ann. And, and uh, you know, I think Paul's got previous on this because didn't he attempt at one point to change the accreditation of their songwriting to McCartney Lennon rather than Lennon All the way McCartney, through his life. Uh, which was overruled it's, by uh, Yoko Ono. Just... Is that right, I... Leslie Ann? It is right, and I think it's that was simply a case of it didn't sound right. You know, when we introduce couples to each other, we tend to say Wendy and Phil rather than Phil and Wendy. It's just the way around that it sounds right. It has a ring to it. Um, Lennon McCartney sounds better than McCartney Lennon. It's but why? Just the why way did he make that? Why did he make that intervention? Because I don't think he he won many plaudits for that. Given, as you said, that John Lennon's not here to have that debate. Mm, it's, it, he must be insecure in some way. Why would yeah. Paul McCartney be insecure? I mean, yeah, why he, is he doing question. this is the bottom line. Uh, John isn't here to give his side. Paul doesn't need the money. I would have told him, let it be. We can't uh -huh. love him any more than we do. Um, mm. Mike, listen, the man's yeah. a genius. That's very clear. The most successful composer of the 20th 
century, but a lot of people just yeah. don't like Paul McCartney. They, they think he's a bit of a numpty. You know, they acknowledge his talent, yeah. but they just find that yeah. he goes around saying, you know, what, what is it, you know, peace man, peace man, and, you know... Well, that, was, that, that was his wife, Linda, really. I mean, that was her influence. Her, her um, V-sign type for peace and all that was a traditional... Uh, so anybody who thinks... Paul McCartney is a numpty, is, I'm afraid, a numpty themselves. You know, there is no great musical genius living on this planet. There is no man who has shaped and created life in the second half of the 20th century. Because the Beatles weren't just songwriters, the Beatles changed the world. Before the Beatles, the world was black and white, coming out of the morose 20 years after the Second World War. After the Beatles, it became Technicolor. The world was turned to Technicolor, and, and it never went back from that, honestly. They invented hippiedom. You know, the word hippie didn't even arrive in this country until 1966, and then the Beatles became the at the forefront of that movement. I mean, their contribution to the cultural development of life over six or seven decades cannot be underestimated, and it's fascinating to be able to read all the details. I, I appreciate very much what Leslie Ann has said. I've read all Leslie Ann's books, and yes, some of the stories are in there. But to see the actual personal explanation from Paul McCartney for some of them um, is is outstanding. On the Lennon-McCartney thing, um, I think he refers to it in this book that John Lennon was a year and a half older than him. So he got to Brian Epstein, who was their legendary manager, about whom a, a new film is coming out uh, very shortly. And because he was the senior member of the group and he was older and it was kind of his band, he, he, got, to, um, he got to Epstein and said, I think it should be Lennon McCartney, because before that... It had been McCartney Lennon on two of their very early um, singles. And I agree with Leslie Ann. Why on earth would Paul McCartney feel insecure about me thing? I mean, even John Lennon, when he was alive, has made the state made the statement, I have nothing to do with yesterday. He literally said I everybody knows the famous story that he woke up in the middle of the night and scrambled down uh, sorry, and, and scribbled down scrambled eggs. Uh, you know, I love your legs or something like that. Yeah, but, baby, but I Lennon love never your legs. yeah. Uh, yes. Never claimed ownership of one word of yesterday, and yet Paul McCartney went off on one, didn't he? You know, some years ago, and said, "I just want to turn it round on that one song, McCartney Lennon." But everybody in the world knows that Paul McCartney wrote that song. It's the most re-recorded song well, in history, know. and people yeah. always refer to it as Paul McCartney's Yesterday. Well, that's it. And you know, Mike, I appreciate your enthusiasm for the book. I, I've, uh, I'm looking mm. forward to having a, a, a look at it very, very soon, although it comes in at a whopping 75 quid, which is uh, not yeah. faint-hearted. But, Leslie Ann, briefly, uh, with, the, with the clock against us, um, why is McCartney so thin-skinned and obsessed with his legacy? As Mike says, he doesn't have to be. He really is an absolute legend of music. Um, for example, he lashed out at the Rolling Stones recently, saying that the, uh, the Rolling Stones are a blues cover band. I mean, that's not very well, fancy, is it? Yeah, they did start out as a blues cover band. That's what they were doing. But the Beatles also were recording other people's songs in the early stages. This is what all bands do when they start out because that's how they get good at what they do. They do their 10,000 hours recording other people's work, and then they start to write their own. Um, I, why is he insecure? Because it's the nature of the artist. It's the personality of the creative genius. Um, they're never quite good enough in their own eyes, and that's the thing that drives them forward to become even better. And, yeah, to become and, he's, and, and also, let's be honest, and also fair to say he is very, very competitive. Of course. Yeah, I was with him actually, uh, must have been July 2019 up in Liverpool at the um, graduation day for LIPA, the Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts, which is in his old grammar school in Liverpool. And he's the patron of the school, obviously. And we had a long chat in the green room before the ceremony started. And he's as sweet as pie. He doesn't forget anybody. He remembers people's names. He remembers that he went to their wedding or, you know, he last saw you on a path in in Florida or whatever it is. And that's something else that adds to his genius is that he doesn't forget anything. However, I think he might have forgotten a few things about the lyrics he's written about here. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favorite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.